All right, so our learning objectives, we're going to talk today about using content blocks and sections and kind of the difference between the two of those and some use cases. We're also going to explore rubric templates, which we recently rolled out not too long ago. And then we're going to go specifically within the question banks and explore some of our new uh, questions that we recently released. And like I said, at the end, whatever time we have left, I'm happy to devote it to some Q&A. So at this time, if you want to follow along and kind of play around with some of these features, go ahead and log into your formative account, formative.com. If you're logging in with Google, Clever, Microsoft, or maybe just an email, go ahead and set that up. If you want to take time now to kind of split maybe two screens so you can see what I'm doing on one and play around with the other one, completely up to you. Whatever mod modality you prefer, go ahead and set that up now. All right. So I trust that we're all set up. So let's go ahead and dive right in. And we're going to start with content blocks and sections. And so for that, I'm going to go into my formative dashboard. So here is my dashboard for all of my teaching initiatives. And to start with content blocks, we're going to go right into the nit and gritty. So um, I'm going to select this new formative. But before that, just a little highlight. You might notice if you haven't logged on to formative in some time, uh, the UX and UI design is a bit different. So formative has gotten a little bit of a makeover. That being said, the functionalities are completely the same. So though the look and feel is a little bit different, it all functions the same. So let's go ahead, if you're following along, click on this plus on this new formative button. And that'll take you to our edit screen where educators can build and design all of their lessons and assessments and basically everything that they're creating for their students. Um, to, to jump right into the sections, what we want to do, well, first thing, I always like to title everything that I work on. So I'm going to title this one level up the name of our level up with formative and this is a webinar and i'm going to go ahead and i'm going to select this plus sign here and that'll take you to our question bank so everything that you are seeing on the right are our question types that we have and notice that we have all kinds of questions for intellectual inquiry um, they're all really flexible they allow for a lot of creativity a lot of innovation across different content areas and across different grade levels so depending on whether you're a premium or a partner user or a free user you might be seeing different options here to the left of these questions you have what are our content types and we're going to actually explore these a bit further today because we're going to be designing the content blocks and seeing how questions can be attached to each of these content blocks. We don't have time to go over all of them, but I'll highlight two in particular. So as you're designing, you know, your questions, you can group any of these question types to any of these contents to create a block. There's audio capabilities. You can also embed and pull from websites um, so that students have an embedded resource and questions attached to it. You can include images, text, videos, a number of possibilities here. We're gonna actually start with an easy example. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna select an image to create my first content block. So I'll click on image and notice my options. I can pull an image from my desktop. I can upload a picture if I wanted to take a picture of a notebook to upload there. I can pick from the Google Drive or I can use Google as a search engine to pull my image. So that's actually what I'm gonna do for this example. Um, and I'm just going to pull a skeletal, I'm feeling like science today. I'm going to pull a skeletal diagram and Google is going to do the search and the filtering for me. I get to kind of pick and choose what I like. So I see this one looks good. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to select by clicking add image. If you're following along, feel free to pull whatever resource you like. We're just playing right now. And my options to create my content block are I can put my questions directly on that content or I can display my questions to the side. So I'm gonna model both. Let's say that for this question, I wanna ask my students to kind of label. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna click on the actual part of the image that I want them to label. And for, you'll notice that for this content, I have all of these question types to choose from um, to build my question, sorry, my content block. And so what I wanna do is maybe I'm gonna use one of our new question types and in inline choice. And I'm going to ask my students um, this. And to create my answer key, I'll go ahead and I'll select in a dropdown. That will give my students some choices. 
And so to list my choices, think of the drop down as like a multiple choice. I'll display them here. So maybe I'm going to give them um, what are some of my bones? The pelvis and ribs is our correct answer. And we'll put one more, the clavicle. And in order for the system to auto grade this, you have to remember to select the correct answer. So I'll go ahead and I'll click on ribs. And if I had more than one drop down, some of the options that I have are I can toggle on partial credit in the event that a student gets one of those drop downs, but not both correct. The, the system will do that math for me. I can toggle on some of these other features, which we won't talk about just yet. And if I wanted to tag this question to a particular standard, I would have the ability to do that by clicking here and finding the standard that ties with that. So lots of choices here. We'll keep this one simple because we're just kind of focusing on content blocks for today. So notice that with this particular example, I have linked my question directly over the image. Now what I want to model is kind of creating another follow-up question within this content block, but not a part of the image. So for that, notice there's two plus signs. You want to make sure that you're clicking on the plus sign that's still inside of your content block so that your questions can stay grouped. Clicking on this one would create an alternative. It would create a, a different kind of question on not that content block. So I'm gonna click here and I'm gonna follow up with this skeletal diagram. Maybe I'm gonna ask a multiple choice question. And I'm gonna ask in this case, hmm, whoops, average, my spelling today. How many bones does the average adult have? Now I'm gonna go ahead and list my answer choices. And at this point, I'll just make some up. 12, <laughs> fragile and not so fragile, also not us. Um, and I'll select the correct answer for the system to auto grade this for me. So I'll go ahead and I'll select 206. And I have some choices. If I want these options to be randomized for my students, I can always randomize the order of the answer choices. I can toggle on a show your work box, although it's not really necessary in this particular example. And I can make the question required, which means that a student cannot submit this formative unless all of the questions have been answered. So I can make that a possibility by simply toggling this on. I can also tag a standard, which I won't do in this particular example. And now what I wanna do is I want us, to, we've created our content block. I want us to preview this on the student end. So for that, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna click on this preview button here on the top right and that'll pull up the student preview. And here is the content block that we just created. So as you can see, you have your content. In this case, we chose an image. And to the right of it, you have the questions that are associated to that image. One was directly placed on top of it, and then the others are kind of on the side. And you can continue to build as many questions as you want, and they'll be um, tied to that image or that content that you're choosing. So I'm gonna close out of student preview. And what I wanna do is I actually wanna create one other content block. So again, if I'm creating a new one, I won't click on this one because this will just continue to expand on that content block. I'm gonna start a new one. So I'll go ahead and I'll click on this bigger plus sign. And if you're still following along, feel free to um, kind of pick and choose whatever content you want here. For this next example, I wanna go ahead and I wanna build a content block around a video. So I will select a video and notice the options that you have. You can, you know, record a video in real time of yourself. You can upload an existing video that you already have. Maybe you're a fan of the flipped classroom and you have a video of yourself teaching a lesson and you want to include that and then ask the application questions for your students. This would be a good um, use of this tool. You can record a screen grab or you can pull straight from Google and YouTube. So in the past, you actually had to go navigate outside of formative, go onto Google, find your Google link, copy and paste the link. We've made that process easier just recently. So you can now literally type what you're looking for. So I'm feeling science-y today. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna look for a tsunami for kids video. And notice this is doing the filtering for me. Let's say this is the one I want. I simply click on it and now it is applied to my formative. And notice we're creating a content block right now. So something that's new with videos is you can actually timestamp questions directly on a video so that as a student is watching your video, they'll get prompted with your questions in real time. And something that's neat is they have the option to, you know, answer the questions as they're popping up. 
or they can wait until they get to the very end of the video and then go back and answer the questions. For this one, I'm not gonna fill it with a ton of questions. I'm just gonna pose my question closer to the end. And notice what happens where I wanna put my question, I simply click on the add an item there. So I'll add an item at about minute 240. And that pulls up once again, my same question bank. So for this question, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna do a free response. And I wanna ask my students, and in the interest of saving us time, let me just copy and paste my question. I'm gonna ask my students, you know, based on what you saw in the video, explain what is the biggest impact tsunamis have on people. So this is a bit more of an open-ended question. I have the ability to toggle on a rubric, which we'll talk about in just a second. I can do a show my work. I can make this question required. I can tag it to standards. Um, I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna go straight to previewing this as a student. So I'll go ahead and I'll preview what this all looks like. And notice we have our original content blank here that's grouped with these two questions. And then separate to that, notice how the, when I navigate how it moves together, question three is linked to this content block for that particular content, which was our video. And here's that question. As students get through or they play that video, once they get to this marker here, this question would pop up on their end. There is no limit to how many questions you can add per video. And you can add any of those question types to the video. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna close out of the student preview because now I want us to kind of shift gears a little bit using the same formative that I've built or the one that you're building. And let's go ahead and talk about sections and how sections differ. And I do see a question. If they don't watch the video, will they still be able to see the question? Yes, they can fast forward to that question. Just like what I just did, I didn't actually play the video. I hovered over, um, I'll go back because that is a very good question. A student can just do this to preview the question because they can navigate. We do like to give our students kind of voice and choice and flexibility with how they answer these questions. Sometimes questions in the middle might be harder than other questions or they might feel like they wanna answer certain ones first. And so we do allow for students to kind of view the video all at once if that's what works for them. And then they can go back and target whatever questions they want to in whatever order works for the student. So great question there. I'm gonna go back and let's talk about um, sections now. Sections are available once again for our premium and partner users. And so the benefits of sections are that you can split your lesson, you can kind of chunk it, split it into parts or common themes. Um, a lot of our teachers like sections because they wanna differentiate, you know, increasing and decreasing levels of support for students. If you're a fan of the gradual release of instruction, sections are great for that because you can really have like really clear main and closing activities embedded into your formatives. And so in order to add a section, all you have to do is, I'm gonna use the same formative, but I'm gonna give it a heading now. So where um, this content block is, if you see this little tiny plus sign, I'm gonna click here and notice you have a layout functionality here that allows you to add a section. So I'm gonna click here and all I have to do is literally click, it highlights, and then I can go ahead and I can title it. So for this one, let's say I wanted to call this my warm up. I can add questions right below it simply by continuing to press on this plus sign. Plus sign means more every time you wanna add more of something. So in this case, maybe I'm gonna add a quick short answer. This is a warm up, so maybe I'm gonna ask my students, how are you feeling today? This is great for social and emotional learning. Maybe you just wanna do check-ins in your classroom. This is great for that. Um, so I'll ask them, how are they feeling today? And then um, we get to this content block. Maybe I'll add a section here. We'll call this um, review. Maybe I wanna do a little bit of review within my formative before I get to the meat of the lesson. So I'll call this review. Remember, once again, I can continue to add questions. I won't do that because we've already kind of set up this neat uh, content block. I'm going to go down and where the, right before this video, let's say this is a different part or section of my formative. I would simply click on that plus sign, add a section here, and maybe I want to call this, you know, part one. And then right after that, um, I would just select this bigger plus sign because I don't have any content after that. And I'll just continue to add a section. And maybe this will be, a, you know, checks for understanding, whatever thematically makes sense 
just know that you have the ability to add sections into your formative. So checks for understanding. Now let's go ahead and preview this on the student end and notice what it's gonna do to your formative or to their formative. This is your end, this is the student end. And when you create sections, you've pretty much compartmentalized the formative for them. So now rather than viewing questions back to back to back, they have to navigate using these buttons to get through your formative. And it's thematic depending on the, the headings that you're choosing to put as your sections. Notice also at the top when it comes to navigation, if students don't wanna start with this warm up, they can click up here to get through the formative. And notice that the content blocks stay linked together. So because that image of the skeleton, notice there's an image there, it's grouped with two questions. That video is grouped with one question. So these are the groupings and how, and these are the sections. And that is how content blocks and sections kind of complement each other. And again, the benefit here is, you know, structure, chunking, organization. You're giving students an avenue to like stay organized and keep within themes to support them through that gradual release of instruction if need be. But also if you're a fan of randomizing your questions with informatives, setting it up in this way with content blocks and with sections allows you to randomize, but your questions stay grouped together by common themes. So that's what I've got on content blocks and sections. Next, we wanna go ahead and talk about rubric templates. So rubric templates by popular demand, we now have them. Lots of teachers were requesting rubrics. Um, I'll go ahead and kind of show um, which rubrics, sorry, which questions have rubrics. So I'm gonna click on this plus sign. And any question, you know that from our question types, if you've been using formative for some time, the majority of these questions are set to auto grade. If you are putting an answer key, the majority will do the grading for you. There are a few that are a bit more open-ended such as the video response, the, um, why am I blinking here? Video response, free response, show your work, file response, and audio response. Those are more open-ended. And so because there's no answer key necessarily to facilitate the grading process for you as a teacher, you have the ability to toggle on a rubric. And so let's go ahead and see how that would work. I'm going to actually use the same question that I have set up here, this free response, because it's open-ended. I am not going to add an answer key, but I will toggle on use rubric. And what that'll do is it'll pull up these options. So you might not be looking at the same thing because you probably haven't. It, it, it depends on if you've set up rubrics, but you can create a rubric from scratch. This is good if you're just going to use it one time. You don't care to have it archived. You just want to use it and apply it to this one question, and you're not going to see it again. Or you can build a rubric template, which will save your rubric so that you can use it in the future. And that's what you're seeing here. These are templates that I have built in the past so that anytime I'm creating a new formative, um, I can always just toggle on rubric and apply that rubric um, to my question. So right now, um, this being a webinar and all, I'm just gonna build a, scratch, uh, a rubric from scratch. So I'm gonna hit untitled rubric. And let's say for this one, I'm building something for my ELL students. So I'm going to call this, um, notice also that takes you to this edit screen where you're building the rubric from scratch. Very intuitive, easy to use. Um, I'm adding my title up at the top. So ELL uh, writing rubric. I can add a description here of what this, you know, what I'm looking for. And then here's my criterion. This is what I'm assessing my students on. So just by clicking on this plus sign, I'm creating the categories. So let's say I wanna assess my students on their writing and any errors and maybe their vocabulary use. I'll go ahead and I'll add that here. I can also add a description. I'm not gonna do that now because it'll take us some time. I'm just kind of modeling the process. And then to tear off your levels, you just add horizontally. So this is, the process by which you would build a rubric. Very easy to use, very seamless, and it's gonna save you a ton of time in the future when you start to save these templates. Um, then here you would just add your levels of proficiency. It could be a beginner, intermediate, advanced, whatever proficiency looks like for you in the classroom. This is an ELL one, so I'm gonna go ahead and use their um, ELL continuum, which I believe is emerging. Then we have bridging. 
And then we have expanding would be one of their more advanced levels. You can also control the point value. So maybe this is gonna start at a zero. This is actually gonna be a one. And something that's new is you can actually also do half or partial partial points now. So this can actually be, uh, why isn't it letting me? 0.5. You can do decimals now in within your rubrics. This is something that's new again by popular request from teachers. Now, once you're done setting all of this up, when you close out, the system will automatically tally your totals and apply them directly to the question. So this question is out of seven points. Now let's go ahead and preview what this will look like on the student end. So what I love about rubrics is that there's that sense of accountability. Students will know exactly, I'm gonna go to question four. Students will know exactly what they're being graded on. So I go to question four. When a student gets to this question, where they see this little blue rubric icon, that tells them that there's a rubric they're being measured on. And a student can always click on it and refer back to it. Now granted, this one isn't thoroughly built out, but let's go ahead and preview one that might be. So I'm gonna close out of this example, close out of here. And I see that there's some math teachers in here. So I'm gonna do you one. I'm gonna go to this plus sign. I'm gonna click on a graphing because there's a little trick I want everyone here to know. So I mentioned that rubrics are available for open-ended questions, but if you really, really wanna use a rubric for something, for any other question type, there's a little trick. All you have to do is enable a show your work because show your work is open-ended. So on any question, by toggling on show your work, you've now enabled a rubric component. And so I'm gonna to toggle on rubric. Let's say this is a math question. I already have a math rubric. I'm gonna actually apply my template this time instead of building it from scratch. I'm gonna click use. And now this problem has a rubric. Again, let's preview it as a student. I'll go to my preview button. I'll go to question five, that graphing. Here's my show your work box. Here's their um, playing field, so to speak. I'll go ahead and I'll answer. Here's my answer. And then as a student, they can always refer to that rubric by clicking on this little hyperlink. And here's an example of what a thoroughly built out rubric might look like on the student end. Now I've answered this. I'm gonna submit it just so you can see what the grading process would look like for you as a teacher. So I've submitted this, I'm gonna close. I'm gonna to go to my view responses. Of course I'm failing. I haven't actually completed anything. I'm gonna to go to question five. Here's my response that I have. My, And here is what the rubric will look like on your end as your grading student work. And so it's very easy wherever, wherever you think that student lands within the rubric, you would just click and then the system tallies up the points for you. So zero, zero and one point here, it's automatically transferred to their grade. And of course, you have the ability to leave them feedback, delay it, optimize your feedback with any one of these um, content tools that you're seeing here to really encourage that feedback loop between students and teachers. So that is our rubric component that we're really excited about. And finally, what we want to kind of cover today is our question bank. So what question types are new and formative? So for that, our new question types are the file response, the fill in the blank, the inline choice, match table grid, and hot text. And for that, I'm gonna actually stick to this PowerPoint and give you all a brief rundown of all of them. I'll show you what they look like as examples. And then with whatever time we have left, we can absolutely, I'll stick around and answer any questions about them. So quick rundown, what are our new question types? We have the fill in the blank, which is, exactly what it sounds like. You have the ability now to include blanks within your answers. Um, and you can put as many blanks as you want. You can toggle on allow partial credit so that if students are getting one blank but not both correctly, the system will automatically tally up what's correct there for you. Similar to fill in the blank, we have the inline choice, which you saw me modeling with the skeleton. It's that drop down, So it's a bit more of a scaffolded fill in the blank because there's some answer choices there to, for students to choose from. This is the process by which you would go about setting it up. And again, if you're putting more than one drop down, you can toggle on allow partial credit in case students are getting some but not both correct. We also recently released match table grid 
which is, I like to think of this as sorting and categorizing made easy. So in this example, students are classifying, you know, these concepts based off of if it's executive, legislative, judicial, this is the process by which you would set that up. And this question really applies to just all content areas. I'll show you a few examples in just a second. Once again, where there's more than one answer possibility, you can allow partial credit in case students are getting some, but not all correct. There's the hot text question type, which I, if I were in the classroom, this would be my go-to question for citing evidence from the text. Um, in this example, you'll see there's a sentence and the teacher is highlighting um, any word that's gonna be an answer possibility. And then the teacher is selecting what the actual answers are. So I'll show you in just a second examples of how you can build more elaborate hot text question types. We also recently released the file response question type, which basically gives students an avenue to upload something outside of formative, say they worked on a presentation or something on a Google doc or maybe a Word doc, and you want to give them an avenue to upload that. The benefit to you is you can have all of their work consolidated on your formative account, linked to a rubric, linked to a standard, so you can have tracking over time, and then students would have that archived on their end as well. You have that possibility now, the file response question type. So let's look at what these all look like, some additional examples here. This is the edit screen on my end, but I'm gonna go ahead and preview as a student. Let it load, and here they are. Here are my drop down questions. Here's my fill in the blank, what this looks like. Here's a third grade example of match table grid and how I might utilize that. Here's another match table grid, but with a little bit more of an elaborate example where students are kind of classifying main ideas to notes. Here's one for math teachers, same question type, but now I'm using it in math. Um, are all of these equal to X equals five? Here's some show your work so they can, you know, if they want to do their work on a sheet of paper, take a picture of their work, upload it here, and then select yes or no for each. Um, here's that hot text. So here's, you know, um, a stanza and students have to select what rhymes from all of these possibilities. Here's hot text as well. You know, there's a pair, two paragraphs. Here's a main idea. Students have to select um, which sentence proves this main idea or this opinion here. And so out of these possibilities, they would go ahead and click on the correct answer. This kind of emulates the rigor of a lot of high stakes exams. And then here's what it would look like on the student end to upload a file response. So I know this is a lot of information. We have about a minute left. I do wanna be mindful of your time. So I'm gonna go ahead and get to the end here. If you have any questions, any follow-up questions, go ahead and in your formative dashboard where you see this question mark, you can always go here to find additional articles on anything that you, you know, if you wanna know more about rubrics, you can search the word rubrics and I guarantee you there's an article on that. If you have ideas for cool things you would wanna see on formative, go ahead and submit them and feature requests. We're a company that listens to our users. So strongly wanna encourage you to utilize this. If you run into any issues, you can always record your bugs and contact us, in, um, contact us here. And then you can view and sign up for future webinars um, directly from this question mark. So we've just about covered everything on our agenda. I wanna be mindful of your time, it's 3.30. I'll stick around if there are any questions. Um, but aside from that, feel free to drop and if, you know, just be on the lookout for that email with a survey, letting us know how we did and you will get that certificate of attendance for this webinar. So thank you all for joining.